Hey, what's going on YouTube? It's your man Soul. Welcome back to the channel. You know what it is when you click. And today we are going over the Cataclysm Talent Bill setup for the Blood DK. So without further ado, let's jump on into it. And before we begin, I really want to talk about how the Cataclysm Talent Trees work. Because if you've never played Cataclysm, you missed out on this, I guess, unique feature, we'll, talk, we'll call it because Cataclysm was the only expansion where they had talent trees like this. You know, in MOP, they went to like the, the six choice options, or not six, but you get one of three for each of every 15 levels. And we used that style up until Shadowlands and then in Dragonflight, they changed it. So if you've never played Cataclysm, this is like the only style of talent trees uh, that was used in, during that time. So I wanted to talk about it. So obviously this excludes Death Knight, but when you hit level 10 on any class, any spec, right? you unlock talent trees and first you have to pick your specialization so you know what i'll use a different class as an example so if you're let's say a level 10 warrior right you hit level 10 you pick one of these specializations and once you pick it you get you know things that are unique to that spec so as an example if you're a level 10 arms warrior you get mortar strike you get anger management you get two-handed weapon specialization and you get the arms mat well you don't get the arms mastery but eventually if you stay arms you'll unlock the arms mastery and what this really means is that fury can't get these things right fury can't get mortar strike fury can't get the anger management passive or the two-handed weapon spec passive but it also means that you know arms can't get bloodthirst or shield stamp so each spec really has their own unique benefit and a lot of times have their own unique ability and uh, passive so that's really what the big change was for Cataclysm. And this provided a really, really huge boost in power once you hit level 10. Um, so I know like in vanilla, only a certain amount of classes really got a super power increase and it really wasn't even due to talents. It was more so due to certain spells that you unlocked as an example. Druids who unlocked the bear form at like level 10, that's a really big power increase. So you could think of it kind of like that where every spec gets a major power increase at level 10. So going back to blood, we see blood gets heart strike, they get veteran of the third war, they get blood rights, they get vengeance, and they get access to their own mastery, which is the blood shield. And again, this means that as a blood DK, I can't select, I can't get frost strike, I don't have access to scourge strike or any of the passives that are uh, affected by frost and unholy DKs. And what I'm gonna tell you the next thing is when you click a specialization, so let's say I select blood, you can't put any talent points into the other specs until you spend at least 31 talent points in whatever spec you chose. So because I chose blood, I have to spend at least 31 talent points in this tree before I can go into any of my sub specs. And I think this was a gift and a curse. I think it was a gift because I think it caused less confusion for newer players, right? So if you wanted to be, let's say a fire mage and you select the fire tree, now you are locked into the fire tree but there's less likely of a chance that you miss an important talent. Um, this is compounded by the fact that, you know, the talent trees are halved, right? So as you can see, the talent trees are not nearly as long as what they were in Wrath or in TBC. So it, it shortens the chance of you picking the wrong talents or missing an important talent because you have to spend the majority of your talent, talents in one tree, right? So I think that's the gift side because it helps a lot of new players um, it causes less confusion for, you know, if you think that something in the other trees look really, really um, appealing, you still have to stick to the fire tree until you can get over there. So I think it caused less confusion and that's the gift side. But the curse side is it really kind of killed customization between players, right? So like as a blood DK, there's like a 90% chance that I'm going to have the same spec as other blood DKs, right? There's like very little wiggle room for like personal customization. And I think, you know, Cataclysm kind of was the start of where you start to see a uh, class homogenization because mostly everybody's playing the same spec. There's no real way to customize. And I'm not saying that didn't, that didn't exist in the previous expansions because it definitely does. If you look at, you know, Warcraft logs, the top 200 are probably using the same talent build setup. But there is, there is a way to spec differently. Like my blood DK spec can definitely be different from the next man's and we can perform the same role, right? So I think Cataclysm is really the start of that class homogenization because it shortened the talent trees. It made you lock into one spec and you really didn't have that many options to choose the non-viable or niche talents. So 
I think, you know, it was a gift and a curse. Let me know what you think. If you think I'm right, if you agree with that opinion, let me know. If you think I'm wrong, let me know in the comments below. But anyway, let's get started with the blood tree. And for the most part, the blood tree kind of operates the same way as the wrath blood tree. We have a lot of the same talent. Certain things have swapped. Um, you will notice that the blood tree is now the de facto tanking spec. I will actually reset that to show you. So yeah, blood is the de facto tanking spec. Unholy and frost are um, DPS specs. You cannot tank in these specs. It will not work. You know, you don't have the tools at all anymore. Like you cannot tank in these specs. Blood is the tanking spec for DK. And it's like that till this day right now, currently. So back to the tree. So yeah, I think for the most part, it's pretty much the same. I'm going to take Blade Barrier. Blade Barrier now is just a passive 6% less damage from all sources instead of spending your blood runes and having to refresh the buff. So that's a good quality of life change. Blade of Armor is still the exact same thing. Gives you a little bit of attack power as you get more armor, scaling yourself up. Improved Blood Tap is pretty new, but it's also pretty self-explanatory. Reducing the cooldown of your Blood Tap by 30 seconds is amazing. Seventh of Blood has not changed at all. Um, however, depending on how you build this, and I'll show you know two variations uh, later in the video where you can see if you want to put one or two points in Seventh of Blood. For me, I would just put one point in Seventh of Blood. It's the exact same talent, literally. It does the exact same thing, so you don't really have to treat it any differently. And then the new talent here we have is Scarlet Fever. So this causes your Blood Plague basically to act as a Demo Shout or like a Vindication where it will reduce the physical damage done uh, on an enemy who's affected by Blood Plague by 10%. So if you don't have this buff in your raid group or you're doing 10 minutes consistently and it might not always be there, I would definitely take Scarlet Fever. For me personally, I like to just cover all bases anyway, even if you know the buff is going to be covered somewhere else i like to just cover the bases so i'm going to pick up scarlet fever regardless because as you'll see later on the other option is, is okay but it's, it's not really that impactful in rating in my opinion so moving on down oh wait before we do that i guess i'll talk about uh, hand of doom hand of doom reduces the cooldown of your strangulate by a minute if you select into it it's not a bad talent but this is more of a pvp thing right you know strangulate is cool but you don't really need more uses out of it in a race scenario like there's multiple people who can interrupt it's cool to you know use on the emergency but you don't really need this talent next we have bone shield which is coming over from the unholy tree and it's swapping places with unholy frenzy and bone shield is a great addition to the blood tree i just i'm just gonna miss unholy frenzy to be quite honest but it, it makes sense for unholy to have another cooldown so i'm not mad at it but bone shield does the same thing that it did in wrath where it gives you you know a certain amount of charges in this case six six charges of uh whirling bones and while they're active you take 20 percent reduced damage from all sources and you deal two percent more damage so bone shield's a really really good tanking tool um like I said, I'm just going to miss Unholy Frenzy, but it's not going to be super impactful. Like, Unholy Frenzy is great for a blood DK, but, like, because you can put it on somebody, but having Bone Shield is way better for the tanking role. Um, I will say this, in my opinion, I don't know why they kept Unholy Frenzy as, like, target friendly, like a, a physical version of Power Infusion. I feel like there's no Unholy DK who's really going to give this away. They're gonna just, just going to put it on themselves. And I think that's even more compounded by the fact that it's not physical damage increased in Cataclysm. It's actually a melee and ranged haste. So I, I really don't know if any Unholy DK is going to put Unholy Frenzy on someone else versus them themselves. Unless it's like a sign by a raid leader. Hey, put this on this person because they're going to carry the phase over. They're going to push the damage. That might be happening. So, But that's just my little two cents on Unholy Frenzy. But yes, Bone Shield is definitely something you pick up. You do not skip Bone Shield. Next, we have a Toughness, which is coming over from the Frost Tree, so it's just going to increase your armor value, which is also going to increase your attack power thanks to bladed armor. And then we have A-Bomb's Might, same thing, increases your ranged and melee attack power. It also increases your strength by 2%, so definitely want to pick that up. Blood Caked Weapon is just a DPS increase. It, you know, it has your, causes your auto attacks to have a 10% chance to do a little bit more damage. This really isn't good for tanking to be quite honest um you might think of you know it as a threat talent but to be quite honest with the new addition of vengeance which is you you getting attack power based on how much damage you take no more than 10 percent or five percent of your maximum health i think it's i think it's 10 percent. but anyway you don't really need this because of the way vengeance work vengeance just gives you so much attack power that you don't need something that has a chance to proc off an extra auto attack like that doesn't it doesn't really uh make anything too impactful so blood cake weapon is really a dps talent to me 
and I don't really know why it's in the blood tree still. Like they could have swapped this out with something else to make it a little bit more impactful. Maybe you can take it if you're subspecting into blood, but I don't even think there's enough talent points to reach this, but I could be wrong. But yeah, blood cake weapon, you, you can skip as a blood DK tank. Next we have these three talents. So this row here is all important and we're gonna talk about each one. The first one is Sanguine Fortitude. So this is basically improved Icebound Fortitude. Um, it reduces the damage taken uh, by your Icebound Fortitude or that your Icebound and Fortitude causes by an additional 30%. So basically making it 50% now. So this change was really so Icebound was kept in line with Divine Protection in uh, Shield Wall because as you know, Icebound Fortitude, the DR that it provides scales up with how much defense that you have. Defense is gone in Cataclysm, so there's no scaling for Icebound. So this is a way to keep it in line with the other Shield Wall style abilities. And it makes it so that uh, it doesn't cost any resources. So really good talent, pick it up. Next we have Blood Parasite. So this is not like the Blood Worms in Wrath of Lich King where you just get a little bit of trickle healing for the very low damage that they do. Now when they spawn, they gorge themselves. So they damage, they deal damage, they deal damage, they gorge themselves up, and then they burst healing you and anyone around you. And the heal is pretty notable. So I think this is a really good overhaul on this talent. And I definitely think you should pick it up because the heal you will definitely notice, especially in emergency situations. And then over here, we have improved blood presence. Another talent that got changed and is not just, oh, you do a little bit of triple healing based on your attacks. Nope. Now it increases your rune generation by 20% and makes you uncritable because the fence is gone. So you got to have a way to not be crit by mobs and dungeons or raid bosses. So this talent will allow you to be uncritable as long as you are in blood presence. That's another side note. Blood presence is the uh, tanking presence of choice. Now frost presence does something different. Blood presence is the tanking uh, presence. So yeah, so improved blood presence you definitely want to take. Moving on down, we have Vampiric Blood. Vampiric Blood got a little bit of a nerf, so instead of increasing healing effects on you by 35%, it is now 25%. Um, it still gives you 15% of your maximum health for the duration, and once it expires, that maximum health is gone. Vampiric Blood is a staple in the blood tree. You definitely want to pick it up. Next, we have Rune Tap. It's the same Rune Tap you know and love. Definitely get it. And then here, we have Will of the Necropolis. So Will of the Necropolis has changed a little bit. So instead of reducing attacks that bring you to 35% or while you're at 35% instead of reducing those attacks by 15% with no internal cooldown now when something damages you to 30% your rune tap ability costs no rune and it's immediately refreshed so if it was on cooldown it comes right back up immediately and in addition to that, all damage you take is reduced by 25% for eight seconds. However, this cannot occur more than once every 45 seconds. And to me, this is a nerf only if you're utilizing will frequently, right? So as an example, on like in phase one on like patchwork where you see a lot of will and necropolis procs for like opportunity strike tanks, right? Or even if you're main taking patchwork as a blood DK. You're getting a lot of value out of Will and Necropolis. So that iteration where it doesn't have an ICD would be a buff over this version, right? If we had this version of Will, it would be okay, but we are just consistently reducing our damage by 15% with no ICD at all times, doesn't have a proc. This one increases the DR threshold to 25%, which is good, and it lasts eight seconds, which is enough time to save your life and get you stable again but it has an ICD of 45 seconds. To me, the internal cooldown makes it a little bit of a nerf. I could be wrong, but that's just how I feel. But again, it's all dependent on how much Will is proccing. If Will isn't proccing that much, then it doesn't really matter, right? If you're getting, you know, one, two, three uses out of it over the course of a six minute raid fight, then this version of Will is better because you're getting a better DR and you're refreshing your rune tap more consistently. But if you're consistently getting hit for low, then the other version is better. So it just depends on the content that you're taking, but it's still a good talent. It's, you definitely still want to pick it up. Next, we have the penultimate tier. We have improved Death Strike, which, you know, it doesn't really need an explanation. It just makes Death Strike better. More damage, increase your crit chance, and more healing. Next to that, we have Crimson Scourge. So Crimson Scourge is an improvement to your blood boil so it increases your blood boil by 20 percent and when you attack something that has blood plague on it there's a chance that your blood boil or your next blood boil i should say will cost no runes 
and that's not a bad proc but to me this is more of like a dungeon crawler slash ad tank thing and in the raid scenario you kind of already have enough tools to really deal with ads you don't really need crimson scourge to deal with really any amount of ads there might be you know one or two fights that i'm not really remembering that crimson scourge could really be great but for the grand scheme of things you don't really need crimson scourge however there is a caveat if you have someone who is consistently and i mean all the time bringing the scarlet fever debuff then you can forego this put one extra point in sense of blood to allow yourself to get down the tree and you can just put those two points in crimson scourge and there you have a, a free 40 percent damage increase on blood boil which might grab some people like if you're consistently raiding with a warrior or a paladin who are bringing who's bringing that debuff you don't really need uh, scarlet fever you can grab crimson scourge with a damage increase and call it a day so that's a very viable option to me it doesn't really matter too much in my opinion i just take scarlet fever over crimson scourge and call it a day and then lastly we have the ultimate talent or the capstone talent dancing rune weapon so dancing rune weapon got a major defensive buff in kata so in addition to copying all of your abilities it will now give you 20 percent parry chance while active which is amazing because obviously death knights can't block so a lot of our mitigation comes from a parry so this is a really really good cooldown now so this is something that you don't skip anymore you definitely want to pick up dancing rune weapon but with that being said, that's it for the blood tree. So we have 32 points in the blood tree. Again, I, I spoke about how to get Crimson Scourge. I spoke about a uh, hand of doom and a blood cake weapon. So that's really it for the blood tree. Now we can move on to the subspecs. All right. So there's multiple ways to build the subspec. So the one that I, I guess, not, not most familiar with, but the one I would recommend the most, I guess, is the one I'm about to show you right here. So this really involves putting seven points in your frost tree and two points in your unholy tree, or these are like your lingering talents so in your unholy tree. So in the frost tree, you pick up rune power mastery, so it increases your maximum runic power by 30. You pick up icy reach, which increases the range on your icy touch. And you pick up endless winter, which re uh, removes the, the resource cost of mind freeze. Sadly, this does not increase your total strength anymore. It's just the, uh, you know, removing the cost of mind freeze. And the lingering talents you put in to epidemic and the reason why i do this is because of a new ability we have called outbreak so outbreak immediately puts on your frost fever and your blood break on the target and it doesn't cost any it doesn't cost anything it's just a 30 second cooldown ability that automatically applies your uh, your diseases and when you take epidemic it increases the duration of blood plague and frost fever by eight seconds so what this really means is your diseases last nearly long enough to for the fact that you don't have to spend any runes on them anymore unless you target switch right so if you're just fighting one boss that doesn't summon any ads or anything you don't have to spend any runes on using plague strike or icy touch you can just use outbreak and epidemic now has increased the duration of your two diseases so you don't ever have to use those abilities you can just use outbreak over and over and over again and i really like that i really like that quality of life change and i think that is more impactful than the other uh talent points that you can put these two lingering talents in but we'll talk about it so if you don't want epidemic you can definitely go into lichborn so with me lichborn was always just like a, a niche talent in my opinion so what lichborn does is it basically makes you an undead for 10 seconds so you're immune to uh, charm fear and sleep effects and the real reason why people pick lichborn is because if you cast death coil on yourself so if you make a macro that self cast death coil that targets yourself and cast death coil at you you'll heal yourself and that's a really cool interaction between the two spells however to me that healing was always just niche it was never really good enough for me to warrant spending into lichborn in my opinion now in a super duper emergency situation if you're out of range of anything you can't death strike anything your rune tap is on cooldown your vamp blood is on cooldown sure lichborn can help you know stabilize you a little bit but those situations are so few and far between that you're always just going to want to be in range of something and hitting death strike right because death strike is going to heal you for more it's going to uh, activate your blood shield and it's going to do some damage so it's going to do all the things better than lichborn healing would do and even with like the talent runic power mastery that's increasing your runic power you're really only getting like 
two, three, maybe four death coils off, really. And I think four is a stretch. So you're really only healing yourself in rapid succession for a lower amount, like three times. So Lich One was always just like, or Lich One healing, I should say, was always just like a niche thing in my opinion. However, Lich One is still good to make yourself immune to fear effects. And, you know, fear effects can be common in uh, raid scenarios. So if you need, you know, a fear break, if you're not a human, by all means, get Lichborn, and you can put your last talent in Epidemic. But I just think Lichborn is just kind of like it's it's a, it's a meh talent. Like I don't use it now. Like you can you can Death Coil heal now, and I don't use it now, so I don't really foresee me using it in the future. But yeah, I like to put the two points in Epidemic and call it a day. Now there's another spec that you can uh, you can go, and that's putting most of your talents into the Unholy Tree. And I think this is really just for dungeon crawling so you can get virulence you can get let's just make let's just max it out so you can get virulence you can get epidemics maxed out and then you can get morbidity and like i said this is more for dungeon crawling for maybe when you're uh, leveling or you're gearing up note that morbidity does not reduce the cooldown of death and decay anymore now it increases the damage it deals by 30 percent, which is a pretty substantial increase in my opinion of course i'm going to miss the death and decay cooldown reduction but you can't beat 30 percent damage increase but this is also a viable way to uh, to raid with too. You can raid with this back and you know not not even bad an eye. Like because yeah, you you won't have the increased running power. Yeah, you'll have a little bit of a shorter range on icy touch, and not having endless winter might get annoying. But none of these are super impactful. Where you're like, damn, we didn't kill that boss because I didn't have increased range or my icy touch or or you know my my I had to save some runic power for a mind freeze like. It's a pretty, it's not an even trade-off, but it's enough, it's not enough of a, uh, of a disparity where you're like, I'm missing out on this. But the reason why I wouldn't go this in a raid scenario is because increasing your AoE tanking capability is okay, but to me, it's never super impactful enough to me to spend all these talent points in where I could really spend them in things that's always going to be impactful. Like, not having a a resource cost on your interrupt is always impactful right increasing your maximum runic power is always impactful where having morbidity having increased damage on death and decay is sometimes impactful so that's just how i feel about it but and, oh one more thing virulence doesn't increase your spell hit anymore it just increases damage done by diseases which i guess is okay but you're a tank who cares right <laughs> so so pick your poison i choose to pick the uh the route of mainly putting my talents in the frost subspec and then going two points into epidemic lastly let's talk about some glyphs and you'll see we have an addition to the glyph section now we have prime glyphs in addition to the major and the minor glyphs and really what this is is prime glyphs are like your damage glyphs they're glyphs that increase your damage from your most consistent abilities major glyphs are like utility glyphs and then the minor glyphs are pretty much minor like they're the same as what they are in wrath Let's look at the prime glyph. So for me, I like to choose rune strike to increase your uh, rune strike critical strike chance. I like to choose heart strike to increase your damage of heart strike by 30%. And I like to choose death strike. So like I said, these three glyphs are increasing your damage really by your three most consistent melee abilities. And the other glyphs really don't either don't work with your spec or aren't impactful enough to me. To be picked over the three that i just chose so as an example excluding all of the uh glyphs that you can't use like howling blast frost strike scourge strike let's look at the glyphs that you can use raise dead yeah your ghoul receiving an additional 40 percent of your strength and stamina doesn't really matter as blood the death coil glyph you could take especially if you're in the lichborn spec because it'll increase your healing done by your death coil so you could take it again lichborn healing to me is very niche even with this glyph so i wouldn't take it you could take Icy Touch, increasing your Frost Fever damage by 20%. I guess if you coincide this with Virulence, it's, it makes it nice for, you know, AoE tanking and AoE threat, right? Or just spread dot disease damage. That's cool. You could do that. Again, I don't think Icy Touch, increasing your Frost Fever damage is more impactful than increasing your Hard Strike, Death Strike, or Rune Strike damage. So that's just me. And then Death and Decay, increasing the duration of your Death and Decay by 50%. So this one is okay. This one's more like a Dungeon Hell to me, though. But for the most part, by the time Death and Decay is over in a dungeon, things are probably going to be dead. So you probably don't need this talent. Unless you're, you know, doing something else in a raid where you're strictly on ads, then you can definitely pick this up. But to me, 
these three glyphs are the ones that you're going to pick for your prime glyphs next we got our major glyphs and the major glyphs like i said they're utility glyphs so there's kind of more options but again i think it just boils down to the strongest ones and in my opinion the strongest ones are dancing rune weapon vampiric blood and anti-magic shell so with anti-magic shell it increases the duration by two seconds which just increases the window of anti-magic shell being useful and you might not think two seconds is such a long time for an increase but going from five to seven seconds is pretty impactful in my opinion i'm sure there's a lot of death knights out there who have missed abilities by mistiming their anti-magic shell by that one second and like that extra two seconds definitely makes up for it so i think anti-magic shell is just a really good glyph to have to just help anti-magic shell blanket more abilities uh, for a longer duration next dancing rune weapon so this increases your threat generation while your dancing rune weapon is active by 50 percent this just really ensures that whatever you're attacking whether the boss whether it's a newly spawned ad sticks with you while dancing room weapons active because a 50 percent threat generation increase is huge nothing's going to be pulling off you while you take something with dancing room weapon on you like so this is just a really really strong glyph for an already powerful cooldown and then lastly we have the vampire blood glyph and to be quite honest i'm on the fence with this glyph so what it does is it replaces the max health that you get from vampire blood and increases the healing effect on you so instead of getting 15 percent increase uh health your 25% increased healing spells done on you goes to 40%, which is a substantial healing increase. It's almost like having a guardian spirit on you without the uh, the cheat death mechanic, right? So it's a really, really, really strong buff to vampiric blood. However, I'm always a fan of last dance style mechanics because it helps it helps soften the blow when I'm getting hit and just in case a healer can't react fast enough it helps me stay alive a little bit longer even though vampiric blood the glyph will help you stay alive because once you hit it that 40% increase obviously works with your death strike it works with your rune tap but the health increase might save your life a little bit more than not having it because the health increase once you hit vampiric blood it, it, it's there whereas the 40 percent healing increase you have to follow that up with an ability or a healer has to heal you when you hit it so i don't know that's just my kind of weird philosophy on it not saying that this glyph is bad but i was always on the fence with it but to be quite honest there really isn't too many glyphs that replace this one so like if we look sure you could take rune tap which causes rune tap to heal your party but that's really insignificant to me you could take Bone Shield, which while Bone Shield is active, increases your movement speed by 15%. This is okay too. However, it's tied to Bone Shield. So once Bone Shield is gone, if it's on cooldown, you're back to regular speed again. So this one's okay. And I still don't think this one rivals the power of the Vamp Blood Glyph. And then you have like Chains of Ice. Your Chains of Ice causes attack. Like that doesn't really matter to me, to be quite honest. Uh, same thing with Blood Boil. Increase the radius of your Blood Boil. Like that's cool, but it kind of is in the same vein as the D, D glyph right so i think these three glyphs these major glyphs are the best out of the utility glyphs and then lastly for the minor glyphs i mean you can kind of pick i like to go with blood tap which no longer does damage to you um i like path of frost because it's weird like it reduces the fall damage you take but i feel like there's like so few instances where this glyph is actually useful it's just fun to have i guess if you do get like knocked up in the air like if you're like for whatever reason like let's say you're tanking heroic ragnaros and you're called to pop a fire trap sure once you go up and get knocked up in the air and you come back down that having that uh having that path of frost will reduce your damage you probably still might die because i remember those things hitting you pretty high but hey you'll take a little bit less damage right and then you have like the horn of winter increasing the duration which i guess is okay um, the other glyphs like you can do uh, resilient grip if your death uh, grip is immune target is immune and resets which is not bad that's not a bad one and that's embraced this is really for like if you're using the uh lichborn like if you're using lichborn healing it refunds 20 root power so you can get like one extra cast if you're using death coil to heal yourself but that's really i don't know inconsequential to me i think probably like if you don't pick the path of frost one like you can pick a uh, resilient grip that one's pretty cool because for the most part most bosses can't be can't be uh gripped like that's there they can't be moved so you could pick resilient grip 
But that's really it for the Cataclysm talent build setup for uh, Blood DK. Let me know in the comments below what you think. Um, I, I wanted to do a Cataclysm setup because obviously, you know, Cataclysm isn't coming for a while. We just got into phase three. But I feel like Cataclysm is still an interesting prospect to think about when you think about all of the things that Kata introduced and changed. Like, you know, sometimes Kata gets a bad rap because it was like considered the first bad expansion, quote unquote bad expansion for a while. But Kata still brought a lot of things that I don't think people remember that were actually really good. So I just wanted to do a quick talent setup and Blood DK was obviously the first pick because I love DK. So that's really it for the video, guys. As always, you know the deal. You've been great. I've been soul and I'm out.